to all of you that I know already. Thank you for uh, for working with us for so many years, and uh, for those that I don't, hopefully we'll get a chance to work together one day. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about security. It is on everybody's mind. In fact, uh, nine o'clock this morning, I had a meeting with a client. Oh no, it must be security we're going to talk about today. So uh, just starting out with some um, statistics, obviously one of the biggest uh, threats today is ransomware. It's not only extraordinarily expensive to solve, um, but it is ubiquitous. Uh, every day there are thousands and thousands of ransomware attacks. Um, it is really a, uh, it, it's a terrible, terrible thing and we have had, uh, um, we have not yet had one of our clients um, suffer from the effects of ransomware, but we have had uh, certainly been exposed to people outside of our organization that that have, and it's just uh, it's it's a terrible thing when it does happen. Um, as you can see, 85% of organizations have some suffered some sort of phishing attack. Um, we, you pretty much see it every day where an email comes in that looks like it might be from someone you know. And if you look a little harder at, some of them are very simple, if you look a little bit harder at the email address, it's not even close to the person that is uh, pretending to send you something from a friend. Um, but it is uh, certainly the delivery vehicle for ransomware um, and malware and general intrusion into your, uh, into your network. Um, and many of those emails do get opened by your staff. Uh, we're going to talk about education during this uh, presentation. And everyone, you know, it says 75% of small to mid-sized mid businesses suffered security threats in last year. Uh, that is uh, certainly true. Everyone suffers threats every day. Uh, whenever we review a client's firewall, we see that it is just getting pounded away by uh, various outside parties looking for a hole. Um, there are many, many robots of many different types out on the internet, and they are looking for you. And if you have vulnerabilities, um, then there are certainly good proactive steps you can take to eliminate those, but it's an ongoing challenge. And um, so most people that you know, and, you're, and I'm sure yourself, me included, can tell you a story about some sort of cyber attack. From the very simple uh, to the embarrassing to the costly uh, to the extremely costly. So certainly uh, we live in a world full of threats. Um, there's two main types of threats. There's <laughs> user credential threats. Those are by far the largest uh, uh, factor in this area and non-user credential threats. That would be somebody uh, hacking into a network. Uh, those are generally robots or malicious individuals looking for some sort of data that are going past user credentials and exploiting some sort of security vulnerability in your network. By far, user credentials is your number one threat. By far. In many, many different ways. Your your users might be great, disciplined users who follow all the rules, etc. Generally, those folks are going to be uh, le much less likely to be, uh, let's say, exploited. Uh, however, even they can be exploited. Uh, but there's many times where users in networks are not as disciplined, are not as cognizant, or maybe didn't pay attention to some of the uh, things that you have sent out to your firm's uh, folks on how to avoid threats, or maybe they uh, do some of the bad habits that we'll talk about a little bit. The non-user credential attacks are certainly much more difficult uh, to protect against depending on how you're set up. Um, user credentials, biggest threat, mostly bad habits and things like that. Non-user much more difficult because there's lots and lots of endpoints to any networks. So that what we're going to talk about in the security vulnerabilities will fall under these two categories. 
And the first one is, is password. So this is the user credential threat that we talked about. First of all, it's very common for users to give their password to others. That is an extremely bad thing because you don't know what the others, persons, need. why would they need it, first of all. Um, if it's an administrator, you can always change a password, so there's really no reason for you to know a user's password. And giving it to another user might be valuable for some sort of sharing, but that, that generally means that instead of using good business practices, uh, the users are just going around the security that you have set up. So one thing you want to make sure is that your users um, don't share usernames and passwords, and that, that's a policy thing. Um, you can do some things to enforce it, but a policy against that is a very, very good thing to do, and it eliminates one bit of the biggest threat there is, again, going back to user credentials. The, the second one, and this one I know a lot about, uh, is using insecure passwords. Um, so, you know, the, the common ones are just a string of numbers or a, pa a password of password. Um, a while back, we had a firm who every user had the same password, and it was password. Um, if you are a hacker and you want to get into somebody's network, you can probably guess the username because it's right there in their email. And the first thing you're going to try is password. Um, so you want to stay away from insecure passwords. So things that involve your life, for example, a birthday, or a son or daughter's name, or your dog's name, things like that. Um, and your network can easily be secured. Almost any network can be easily secured against this by making requirements on how passwords should be formatted. Um, that's where we get into the policy-based part down below. So for example, you could have a, a policy that was uh, passwords need to be eight characters long, they must include a non-alphanumeric character, such as an exclamation point, for example. They must have both upper and lower case and both letters and numbers. Um, Generally speaking, that would be a very good policy. It's a very common policy. Um, and we generally recommend that passwords are rotated often. Uh, 90 days is a good period under which to ro rotate passwords. Many times, however, firms will chafe against that and certain users will chafe against that simply because it's a little bit unwieldy. And um, so there are, there are ways to mitigate that, but it is a good safety factor, and the many many of our clients who are under the, uh, let's say, review or audit of their clients, so if you have banking clients or you have financial services clients, say someone like a, a large insurance company or a bank or, or a, a, a investment company, they're going to require those sorts of things. So they're going to be part of your life anyway. Um, so the you know those are those are also very very good policies. Also the last one here using the same password. This is far underrated and everybody does it. Um, if I could virtually ask you to raise your hands, I would guess that 80 or 90 percent of you um, will say that you either do this or know of this. I myself am raising my hand because I have in the past done it. So there are threats out there for this, and here's how they work. A, some sort of attack is used against you. It might be phishing, it might be something that is capturing keystrokes, it might be screen captures, it could take a variety of forms. And the hacker, generally a robot, it's not actually a person, um, captures your email address and a password that is being used in an innocuous site. Let's say you go I use REI sometimes to buy camping equipment, for example. So I go to REI and I put in my, uh, my email and my password and I log into REI. What these robots do is they capture the email and the password and then they will try that email and password on every site they can find. Amazon, uh, bribes.com, you name it, that robot is gonna go out and use that combination of password and email address to hit everything it can find. 
and sure enough it is going to find some places where you've reused that password and then it begins to operate on you in my case I experienced this with Amazon who that was absolutely great in solving it uh, did not cause me any injury uh, but boy did I learn my lesson and this was several years ago and um, uh, that th that is a fantastic company I can't say enough about doing business with them uh, they solved it uh, very quickly and to my favor but it's an example of how this can happen so one of the things you're going to want to do as you're educating your staff is encourage them not to use a password that's used anywhere else now my wife used to work for a very large corporation and they had an extremely tight security policy and if you used a password that was used anywhere in their system on any site outside of theirs it would capture it and it would lock you out of their system so they were concerned about this a long time ago and this is a very large corporation that all of you know and use every single day um, so I can't emphasize enough how using a different password for every place you go how important that is and how important it is to have secure passwords complexity non -rel nothing related to you etc obviously educating your staff is a huge huge advantage to you and educating your staff can be done very simply certainly uh, doing things like this having them attend security seminars or putting them on yourself uh, those are easy simple things to do sending out periodic emails letting them know what sorts of things are going on um, and then you can go further by having policy based administration as I was talking about so enforcing uh, passwords to be complex eliminating the use reuse of a password in other words you can have a policy in just about any network that does not allow the same password to be reused for a certain number of times so maybe 10 times uh, the last 10 passwords might have to be unique but the best protection is multi-factor authentication and what that does is it adds another part to your login so you have your username and your password which are the keys to the city in terms of your network And what multi-factor authentication does then is it verifies that it's you and all of you have gone through this and all of you have experienced this maybe working with a bank or working with uh, some so online software products where they want to send you a code that you have to enter in in order to enter their system um, that can be done on your network uh, it's much much more difficult on an in an on-premise network it can be done usually it is only done for remote access which is really what most people are concerned about in a cloud network it can be pervasive meaning it always must be used it's very simple to use multi-factor authentication and it is by far the best protection against uh, all of these threats for user credential attacks the next one is excessive access and we see this all the time I cannot emphasize how often we see this and it is a giant risk so here's what happens you have your users and they're working along and one of them has an issue with a piece of software and your IT provider or perhaps an in-house person comes in and they cannot seem to figure out why this user is having a problem and they suspect that it might be that they don't have enough rights to the thing that they're trying to get to so what do they do they make that user a network administrator and that network that user now has the keys to the city so if they are undisciplined or if someone if their login is shared with someone else in the firm or they simply do malicious things that they may not even think are malicious that is a huge risk so user access must be carefully controlled they sh your your rank and file users should have absolute untethered access to the things that they need to see but the things they don't need to see they should not have any access at all to 
And this is very simple. Most networks work on a give access basis as opposed to take away access basis. So generally this is not very difficult to do. But what it means is that when a sticky situation comes up with a piece of software or going back to that situation above, you can't, as an IT provider in our case, and one thing you'll see at Affinity is we're very, very careful about this, or any IT provider or any in-house person must be willing to fight the problem until they find out what the real problem is rather than taking a shortcut with the idea that they will come back later. That is a very, very dangerous situation. So it's very important to restrict access in reasonable ways. It is important to have good policies around security so that management can decide what sorts of things people can see. Um, that's That part of it's probably as important as any of it because this, there's no one else equipped to make those decisions. So it must be a management decision at the firm. The next is to audit things periodically, um, it, depending on how often you have changes in users and changes to the network. Audit should be performed from time to time to see what access looks like for users. And you can, if you wish, introduce some monitoring tools to see where people are going and what sorts of things they are doing. Um, generally, those tools are rather intrusive and somebody has to pay attention to them so they can have a cost beyond just the tool itself. But they can be quite valuable if there is a problem. The next is uh, workstation security, and this and this really, um, you know, sort of also flows into the network security itself. So that when a an operating system on a on a user's desktop, generally in today's world, that's going to be either aside from Macintosh and those sorts of environments, which do have their vulnerabilities. In the Windows world, you're going to see Windows 7 and Windows 10. If those uh, local desktop uh, operating systems are not updated and patched regularly, then they will have openings for non-credentialed attacks. And the non-credentialed attack gets into the local desktop and then uses tools to capture the user's credentials and then that robot is in, into the entire system. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of ransomware attacks, for example, where uh, maybe they came in through user credentials or other means where it was able, the ransomware was able to get into the server and boy is that horrendous and we'll, we'll deal with that a little bit. But keeping, a workstation is an endpoint and it's a good way to think about it. So that endpoint has to be protected. And so keeping your operating system patched and updated any software that is loaded locally on that desktop and in an on-prem network, that could be a lot of software and it's generally going to be more or less out of control because the user can do just about anything they want. Those software applications, Adobe Acrobat for example, must also be patched. Microsoft Office must be patched. Uh, there are JavaScript exploits, there are Flash exploits, uh, there's there's a million of them. If you think about just about any application. So keeping uh, the local desktop happy in an on-premise network is extremely important. It is also important in a cloud network where there's a virtual desktop, but those are easier to maintain because you can globally update them. Uh, they're much easier to keep users from having bad habits on, So, for example. Um, the, the one we see quite often is when anti-malware products are either disabled or not kept up to date and the and the user may not know so uh, as an example most law firms use a si single managed anti-malware package that automatically updates all of the local operating systems all the the, the desktops and this is true both of a cloud or a on-prem network um, but what can happen is other other uh, anti-malware products can be introduced to local desktops. We see this quite often where uh, a user gets some sort of problem 
and either a local IT person or, or perhaps uh, uh, an IT provider goes in and they download a utility to clean that software. And we come in later to look at what's going on with the network and we see, and this is not unusual, three and even four anti-malware products all running on the same desktop. Often they will disable each other and or will give you false positive uh, notifications. That is a very dangerous situation and disabling security uh, protection no matter how you got there and it can happen when you're installing software. Maybe somebody disables something so a piece of software can, can be installed. No matter how they get there, that is an extreme vulnerability. Because generally those products do a pretty good job if they're up to date against things like ransomware and even bad user habits can be protected to a great extent by excellent enforced malware protection. And keeping them up to date is crucial. And that means that uh, really there's two cases in today's world. One is a cloud-based anti-malware system. Those are generally up to date to the minute. Uh, because the uh, provider of that software is just updating one place and it automatically gets to everybody, assuming they have not disabled it or removed it in some way, which can be prevented, by the way. In-house anti-malware systems are commonly not up to date. One of the things that we see often when we review networks for potential clients is servers with no anti-malware on them at all. And usually when we go in to then do some things on the network, we find that those servers are infected. And cleaning uh, viruses, even simple old viruses have been around forever, cleaning those things off of a server is time consuming, it is expensive, it's crazy. It is just absolutely crazy. So security protection has to be not only on the operating system for the workstation, but everywhere in your firm. It should be always enabled and you should make sure it's up to date and that there are no competing products. And this is especially interesting when you have remote access because what about that new endpoint? So commonly remote access is done through either a terminal server or a Citrix server. And that opens up some vulnerabilities to the remote computer having a problem. So having a uh, system that enforces anti-malware on the remote computer is a very, very good idea and not terribly difficult to do. Um, and lastly, if do you allow users to put data on their workstations or perhaps on a on a personal laptop? This is very dangerous because you don't, on a personal laptop especially, because you don't own that thing and you don't know what kind of protection it has on it. And if a, a bad person gets access to it, they're going to have a field day and do whatever they can do with that information. Now, generally, they're not looking for the document about the lawsuit and that sort of thing, but it can happen and these things are very, very dangerous to reaffirm. And certainly, if you do go through a, a info security audit from a large corporation, they're going to require that either data does not ever live on workstations or that workstations are encrypted. Uh, usually, um, BitLocker is used, uh, the Microsoft solution. There, there are many ways to do that. But it's expensive, it is intrusive, and it can have issues in terms of software compatibility as well. So the best way to do it is to not have any data on workstations, which again leads towards the, the more secure solutions you can get in the cloud. Going back to something I said earlier, updates to applications are very, very important. Um, because there are exploits within applications themselves, as I mentioned, things like Flash, Java, uh, um, Adobe Acrobat, which are commonly used applications. You don't really think about your Acrobat reader, but keeping it up to date is very, very important. So one thing that you want to really be focused on is, uh, and I always take Adobe as the, as the example because almost everybody has it. Keep it up to date. And there, in today's world, there's a really easy way to do that. Uh, most people buy, and you can buy it either through your, your software vendor or directly from Adobe. You can buy a subscription to Adobe. And many 
vendors of software are going to a subscription model. And it may seem that its cost is high and, and there's all kinds of different evaluations of that or you don't want to make changes and that sort of thing. But the reality of it is that if you if you do get software through that model, it will always be up to date and the vendor is going to provide patches to it as they arise. And those things can, the thing that you don't think about is, well, sure, it's an extra few bucks a month to keep it up. Uh, so I don't want to spend that extra few bucks a month because I've got 20 people that need it. But the first time you are exploited, the first time you have to clean some sort of ransomware or God forbid ransomware gets you and corrupts your data, which is even worse, and I'll talk about that in a second. The first time you have to do that, all that savings just went away. So we always encourage our clients where it is available to use applications that can be updated automatically, very simply, and are always kept up to date. And subscription model is a great way to do that. Um, and that way, the known vulnerabilities that are sitting out there right now can be taken care of very, very simply and with a modicum of, of uh, intervention, let's say. Um, so I wanted to go back to ransomware for a second. We experienced uh, not one of our clients, uh, fortunately, um, although one that uh, we had talked to on, on a number of occasions, um, they were invaded by ransomware and the ransomware attack did get to their server and it encrypted all of their data. So they had no choice but to pony up and pay the ransomware people uh, the, the ransom, so to speak, and they did that. And after that, the ransomware people attempted to restore their data and couldn't get it all back. So most of their data was just gone. And these are the kinds of things that are so easy to prevent. And when that, ha imagine the cost of losing a large chunk of your data. Imagine the cost, even if you have a great file room full of printed copies of recreating that data and explaining to your clients that you have lost their data and do not have it. The cost of that could be the, the firm. It could mean the end of the firm. Do not take those sorts of chances. Generally speaking, these are easy things to do. They require some attention, but if you, if you do this right, it's not a lot of attention, it's pretty simple, and while there's a cost to it, it's far lower than the risk. Um, another huge vulnerability, and I sort of touched on this in my the last part of my discussion, is back, data backup. That is, this is a huge issue that we see over and over again when we go in to review a network. Well over half of the networks that we review do not have a backup at all, and they do not know that they don't have a backup. The ones that do often are using systems that, are, that have failed, and they don't know that they've failed. And I don't mean that they don't have a backup, but for example, we've seen many, many firms that are using... Uh, some inexpensive software, which I will not name, to replicate their data to an off-site location. And time and time again, we go in, and that software is not in any way, shape, or form replicating anything. It's sitting there with error messages, it's very difficult to maintain, and somebody has to be staring at that thing all the time. So even though it's cheap, it doesn't work. So what good is that? So let's talk about data backup because it is a security risk and it's, it's a huge protection against uh, a, a ransomware attack that does somehow get through. So if we take care of everything else and, and there's user gets attack, a phishing attack and, and has bad habits and, and ransomware gets in, what do we do? Well, we got to go to our backup because we've already taken precautions. We don't let anybody store any data on their local machine, so we don't have to worry about that. We only have to worry about whatever it could get to on the server, and we're going to take care of that server by backing it up. So the first thing is, do you have a backup? When was the last time you checked? Uh, there's affinity clients on this call who have monitoring. The last time you checked, if you're an on-premise network, is last night, because we check them carefully every day, assuming you have monitoring. If you have a cloud system from Affinity, it's checked multiple times a day, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the uh, backups in the cloud are far more efficient and far more 
recoverable, so to speak. The first thing is really simple. Can you restore anything at all? The next part is your frequencies. That's RTO, recovery time objective. How fast can you get back up if data is erased? And RPO, recovery point objective, how far back in time are you going to have to go when you do that restore? So a common answer to these questions it, on an on-prem network, let's imagine an on-prem network that is protected by, say, a backup to a USB drive or a backup to uh, a tape drive or something like that. An RT, a common RTO would be 24 to 48 hours on that type of protection. Could be longer, depends on what happens. Um, recovery point objective is typically the day before. But let's imagine for a second that something happened the day before that wasn't uncovered until today or late maybe that thing happened five days ago or even ten days ago what if your backup doesn't go back that far your recovery point objection objective could be forget it <laughs> it could be nothing but typically with those old school solutions the answer is last night so you lose the day's data um, so uh, the next thing is what are you doing to verify that backup. Now there's two types of off-site backup. There's image-based and there's file-based. File-based backups are very easy to, to uh, verify uh, because they're, they're file by file and you can do uh, checksum comparisons. Image-based are much more difficult. Image-based backups require the image itself that is maintained by the backup system to be checked for integrity. Uh, we have run into quite a few clients who have lost data to an image-based off-site backup. They're not necessarily bad backup solutions, but they can be dangerous and they must be verified. So there's an extra cost there and a hidden cost to make sure that those are checked for integrity at least every 90 days. Um, when you're transmitting your backup off-site, some are simple. Uh, the uh, drive or the tape goes in someone's satchel and it goes home with them. It's obviously not much of a disaster recovery solution because if that person has the same problem that the office does, then everything is gone. Um, but it's relatively safe unless those things are stolen, and that's fairly easy to encrypt against. Um, but most uh, firms today do some sort of off-site backup, and they're transmitting their data over the web in one form or another. So it's important to know that that transmission is encrypted. And most systems do that, but it is worth checking to see what your encryption levels are for backup because that's a good way to pick off some data if a hacker wants to get to you. And then the next thing is um, not related to technology at all, but what is your policy at the firm if there is a disaster, if there is a breach? Breaches are very important because your clients need to know about them right away and how do you couch that, et cetera. If there is a loss of data, what is your policy? If there is a disaster that affects your firm, who's responsible for doing what? I would encourage you all to prepare a, a strong disaster recovery policy that has nothing to do with the data itself because that's mostly a technology challenge, but who does what, when do they do it, how do they do it? So that when the inevitable disaster does occur, and disasters can take many forms, uh, deleted folders up to the building is gone, um, what do you do? The next is user tracking. So we actually get this call fairly often. Um, firms can maintain audit logs on their networks that will, uh, the network will tell you where a user's been, what they're doing, etc. The problem with that is those logs can get quite large and take up a lot of space on the network. So generally most networks are built with some trimming to those logs so they either are turned off if the firm deems them to be inconsequential or if they are turned on they are trimmed regularly and automatically so that they do not disrupt the firm by filling up a hard drive. Um, but what they will tell you is who accessed what. So if something gets out of the firm, and we've seen this many times, we get the call, uh, something happened to this document and it got to the wrong place, we need to know how it got there. 
generally we can find that out without audit logs, but it's nice to have them. Um, the question is generally, was the data sent off-site? And the biggest threat there, and this goes back to the very first thing we talked about, your biggest threat are, is your users. And I don't mean to say that they're malicious generally or they're mean or you know trying to get you or anything like that. Certainly that can happen, but users might have bad habits or users are generally going to be interested in their own well-being, etc. So the one we hear about most often is an attorney leaves a firm and the firm will call us and say we want to know if that attorney has taken any documents and sent them outside the firm. So first of all, let me answer that question for you without even ever calling Affinity. If you ask that question, the answer is yes, they did. We, have, I don't think we've ever had one where the answer wasn't yes. Generally, it's done very simply. The user goes in, they get the document they want, they email it to their Gmail address. That's the common way to do it, because you can make anyone you want, and off it goes. In some case, it's thousands of documents, because generally the, the attorney or the user knows they're leaving, and they generally believe that they are going to take clients with them, which, you know, it's a, an accepted practice, happens all the time in the legal industry, but certainly they shouldn't be sending data while they are still working for you. And it's a very difficult thing to track, and it's a very difficult thing to prevent. Um, so uh, there, there certainly are ways to look at it, to look for unusual activity and that sort of thing. But the answer is you already know who your threats are. You already know who the people are in your firm who are going to have this problem. So um, these are really personnel issues, and I leave it to you to decide what's best to do about those things. But they are very, very common. The other one that's a little scary are utility users, and, I, and I, I'm calling out Equitrack here. Equitrack is a great program. It's everyone has Equitrack or some form of it, or maybe vendors who have access to maintain their software. It is very common for them to use the same username and password over and over and over again with many different clients. That is extremely dangerous. And if a bad guy of some sort or a robot gets a hold of those credentials, then it can determine what the target audience is and try every network it can find. And in it goes as that vendor password, vendor user, and often those users have a lot of rights. So utility users can be very, very dangerous and should be closely monitored, uh, potentially turned on and off. Generally, firms like ourselves and our competitors do not like that, and they don't like it for the firm's benefit. And the reason why they don't like it is that there's a process to help a user if access is not there, and that process can delay the ability of your provider to get to your user and assist them. That's quite different from a piece of software that has a vulnerability in a username and password. So I would encourage you not to restrict your IT company. You should find an if you do not trust your IT company, get a new one. They are going to have carte blanche to your network, and if you don't trust them, then switch to Affinity because <laughs> you can trust us. <laughs> in any case, um, but your utilities, again, things like Equitrack or there are certain uh, time and billing applications where there's a, a remote user access, those are generally not going to be as emergency related and uh, so keeping track of those, enforcing good password uh, protocols on those vendors, that is your choice to do. Um, those, are, those are absolutely essentials uh, so that you can be protected against those sorts of attacks. So is your network safe? Well, what do you have to protect your network? Certainly, almost everybody has a firewall. Boy, we've seen a lot of networks that don't even have a firewall. Your firewall should be a UTM device, Unified Threat Management Device. Common ones are SonicWall, Sophos. Uh, you see 
um, some other vendors, uh, and there's a lot of good ones. Um, they all pretty much do the same thing, and uh, you can go from one to another, and they'll all say they're the you know Fortinet. They'll say, oh, the, we're the best ones because of this, and Sonic will say that we're the best ones because of this. They all pretty much are doing the same thing. So, number one, have a firewall. Not everybody does. Number two, make sure your firewall is uh, has unified threat management. Number three, make sure that unified threat management is kept up to date at all times. So when the renewal comes up, renew it. When the firewall goes end of life, replace it. This is your first line of defense, so to speak. Um, you need malware protection. Generally speaking, you know, you, here's here's my comment on this. Whoever your IT provider is, if you're using them primarily to support your network, as opposed to you have an IT department that makes those choices themselves, if you're using an IT provider, get the anti-malware that they want you to get. And the reason is they will know how to make it get along well in the sandbox. For us, that's generally Symantec. Other vendors use different things. Get the one your vendor wants. That will be the best way to make sure it's up to date and it is well handled. It's not interfering with legal software that sometimes doesn't like certain anti-malware packages. So they, they will know how to solve that if they're a legal specific vendor. And please, if you're a law firm, have a legal specific vendor. That just makes a giant difference. Um, so make sure your malware is there, up to date. Strongly recommend cloud anti-malware so your updates come more often. You're more, much more likely to have protection against an emerging threat more quickly than a locally installed system. Um, keeping your system relatively up to date. Once you get out to that four and five year spot, you potentially could have a lot of updates that need to be done and you could have a lot of threats to your network that you don't even know about. So keeping it patched even if it's older, keeping uh, your applications patched, those are all key things. And they can be done relatively simple, simply if you stay on top of things. If you let things go, for whatever reason, to save perceived saved money, or any of those sorts of things, it will eventually bite you. And when it does, it is horrendous. Um, making sure your staff is educated, I would recommend having a system of alerts to let your staff know about emerging threats. All of you that are on our mailing list see alerts from us when something comes up. There are other vendors around who send alerts out as well that are very, very good. Um, keep an eye on those. I uh, We subscribe to US CERT. Um, that's a very good way to find out about just about everything. It may overwhelm you because you'll get a US CERT pretty much every day. Um, and that can be tr tough to sort of cert, uh, sort out the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, but it does have lots and lots of good information. Um, and watch for malicious activity. You probably already know it's there. Watch for that. Be, be vigilant about it. So make sure your staff is educated, is watching for malicious activity, and that you help them by pushing information to them that's easy for them to digest. And lastly, these are all these just basic, simple things have a real disaster recovery system. It's important. It's really important. And a quality DR system is unimaginably important when the bad thing happens. Um, so if you just have some good security and an educated staff and disaster recovery in place on prem or cloud, that's going to go a long way towards keeping your network safe. Um, as far as disaster recovery, as we mentioned before, make sure you have a non-IT disaster recovery plan. There's a variety of things listed here. Uh, this is not by any stretch a comprehensive list, but what about your phones? Many phones are uh, VOIP and locally based VOIP systems. I am a big proponent, and we just did this ourselves, of moving to cloud-based VOIP. Wow, that is a wonderful solution. Um, in-house phone systems often will include a server, and that server may be completely unprotected. Uh, we have seen many attacks through phone servers. Um, what about email? What about email being down? Um, you know, if you have a problem with your local network and email lives where your network is, um, 
then you know having a product like Mimecast, for example, that's going to intercept those things is always a good thing. Or having some backup plan for that. Obviously, cloud email systems, the common ones being well, there there's really one ubiquitous one, and that's Office 365. Those have outstanding uh, uptime guarantees and uptime statistics as well. Uh, what happens if you can't get into your office space? What do you do? So again, these are non-technical plans, but what do you do? Uh, there are companies that will sell you a place where you can go. Um, not as huge a fan of that if you have a reasonable plan. Um, again, they're, if your office space has a problem and you have an on-prem network, you're probably in big trouble to start with. Um, so uh, <laughs> there's better things to do <laughs> than have that solution. What if you lose data? What is your plan? Uh, who should know? Who's going to take action? What can you do? What are your expectations? And the bad one, of course, is ransomware. What is your plan, non-IT plan, for ransomware? Let's. We've been talking a lot about on-prem versus cloud, and I want I want to go through this briefly. Um, so on-site networks are really a thing of the past. In the in the past uh, two years, we've put in two on-site network versus nearly 70 uh, cloud networks. It's overwhelmingly going in the cloud direction, um, and and there's there's really good reasons. Most of which have to do with security. The security in the cloud is by far better than any security you could ever build in an on-prem network. And and if you look at the the firms that have had hacking problems and the companies that have had hacking problems, they're all maintaining their own system. Very few are in true cloud networks. Um, and, this, and one thing to remember is an on-prem network is already in the cloud. You can send email. You have a handheld that gets your email contacts, etc. You have users who can connect to your system remotely. You can your users can browse the web. You are in the cloud already. So what have you got to protect yourself? Well, let's first start with certifications, which mean, is your data encrypted? Is it safe? Can rogue employees get into your data? Um, a true cloud solution, like the one you see there, the Affinity Cloud Platform, which is uh, built primarily on Office 365 and Amazon Web Services, we have all security certifications. When the bank comes around and wants you to have ISO 27001, you have it already. You want HIPAA? You've got it. All certifications versus none. And you're never going to certify your local uh, system uh, for those sorts of things. It's very costly. And cloud providers can do it because they have scale. Encryption. Generally, firms don't have any encryption. We have a few that on a few that were in on-prem networks. Most of those have moved to the cloud. At least with our cloud, and this is not true of most cloud providers, we provide encryption in transit and at rest. At rest encryption is required by banks, what they call DAR, data at rest encryption. We bundle that in, and you've already got it. Uh, having that in a uh, local network is costly requires maintenance and a lot of watchful eyes to make sure that it's not interfering with your users uh, with your users uh, activities firewalls obviously in the cloud you can have a much more advanced firewall you can scale firewalls you can keep them up to date to the minute as opposed to a local device nothing wrong with a sonic wall firewall nothing wrong with a local Sophos firewall nothing wrong with a Fortinet firewall however the firewalls in the cloud can be faster, have way more advanced features, automatic reporting and things like that, that are more costly and difficult to do in an on-prem network. Um, on, you, almost everybody has some form of remote access, and most have just have basic encryption, SSL encryption on their remote users. Um, with, a, with a cloud network, it's much easier to have multi-factor authentication and much better encryption that encrypts before connections are made and things like that to pr protect credentials against key loggers. A true cloud solution will have much better protection. And, and in, in our cloud, we generally are using um, uh, Amazon Web Workspaces, which are much more secure than a, a terminal server or Citrix server. Um, the security might be a locking door as opposed to barbed wires, guard dogs, etc. Um, uh, disaster recovery, instead of a backup, massive redundancy 
and uh, and frequent replications. Um, in a true cloud, it is a virtual private cloud. The cloud provider, in our case, it's Amazon Web Services, does not have your encryption keys. They cannot see your data. I'm going to move rather quickly because we only have a few minutes left. So if you are looking for cloud solutions, make sure it is a private cloud. You can see over here to the left, this is the Affinity Data Center, the heart, literal heartbeat of Affinity. I'm just kidding, obviously. We love this picture because it's so cool with all those tapes. Um, but a true cloud solution will be at a major cloud provider. Um, Amazon is by far the largest. Uh, others would be Microsoft, Azure. Um, Google Cloud Platform, um, as opposed to a colo or a hosted location. Are you kidding me? That is not the cloud. That is a data center. Um, private clouds are going to be encrypted and secure. Uh, these are just some of the certifications that our cloud has. L let's just say this. It has them all. Um, so there are many benefits beyond, uh, cloud networks have many be benefits beyond the 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 security, including you can work from anywhere, you can work from any with any device, and they generally save you a lot of money, especially down the road because you're never making large capital investments. Um, so I'm going to move on here and uh, wrap this up so that I we can encourage some questions for you. Uh, so Angie, I will turn this over to you. And uh, there you can see uh, uh, folks that are online. If you'll put your questions into the chat panel, we'd be happy to answer those for you. Yeah, any questions, uh, as Doug mentioned, happy to answer, ha answer them for you. What you do is you use the chat feature. You can expand that feature and just go ahead and type in a question. You could send it to everyone or to Doug or to me, whichever you prefer. We'll give it a couple of minutes here, see if anybody has any questions. I also wanted to say thanks, everybody, for hanging in there. I'm sorry I sort of wrapped it up quickly, uh, mostly because at the end we were, you know, more talking about our cloud solution, and I'm sure many of you have heard about that or, or even have it. Um, any of you who haven't, uh, please let us have a chance to come and talk to you at least. Uh, we can probably save you some money. Um, I'm 100% sure we can make your network way more secure, reliable, and resilient. Um, so, uh, you know, come and talk to us. It's, it's worth your time. Any questions? Not seeing a whole lot come through. Angie, are you seeing any? Yeah, I have one question over here from uh, Veronica. Um, do you have any insight about subpoenas and cloud servers? Yes, I have excellent insight on that. There is a, uh, uh, there is a law on the books that requires a cloud provider to turn any subpoena they get over to the owner of the data. The cloud provider does not own the data. And the law says that the subpoena must be turned over to the owner of the data, and the owner of the data gets the same exact amount of time to respond to the subpoena. And additionally, in our cloud solution, the data is encrypted from the cloud provider. So that subpoena, if it was sent directly to the cloud provider, doesn't do any good because the cloud provider, they may be compelled to provide the data, but it's encrypted. So the, the receiving party can't do anything with it. So the cloud actually does not in any way uh, restrict the firm from protecting their data from subpoena. And in some ways, it makes it much better. So essentially, to wrap that up, the subpoena has to be turned over to the firm, and the cloud provider, even if they're forced to provide the data, cannot provide data that can be seen. Any, any other, other questions? questions I don't see any more coming through here. Um, Greg said thank you very much. You're welcome, Greg. Thank you, Greg. It was great to see you <laughs> on the list there. Thanks for coming. And Veronica says, thank you. Perfect. And then we've got another question here. Okay, this sure. is from Ter Terry. Terry would like to know, uh, I would like to tune up. I would like a tune up at our office. I don't. Oh, sorry. Never mind. It's private. Never mind. <laughs> Let's yeah. delete that. Delete that. I'm sorry, Terry. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So uh, any right, other we'll questions? We'll get in touch. No problem. Yes, we will. And just to let you know, everybody will receive an email with a link to a recorded, a recorded session of our, our session. 
and um, we'll also be posting it, that on the Affinity YouTube channel as well. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you very much everyone. Thank you for, for attending and um, please feel free to, to reach out to us. Again, as I mentioned, everybody will receive an email with a link to the recorded session and our contact information if you don't already have it. And we look forward to seeing you at another Affinity University session. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.